everybody. Welcome to White Line Fever Live. And if you're listening on the podcast, uh, welcome back. I really felt that uh, I should dedicate a show or a part of a show or at least uh, mention um, the great rock journalist Malcolm Dome, who we we lost just over um, a week ago. And I noticed that uh, my next guest has, has already paid tribute to him in, in a few places. And in fact, that Malcolm may have written some liner notes just very recently for, for this fellow's Band. So I'm sorry to introduce him on a sombre note, but I promise that we will all, um, you know, the um, enthusiasm and cheeriness will pick up as we go along with our conversation. But uh, from Twisted Sister, JJ French. How are you, JJ? I'm very well. Thank you for having me. No, um, it's, it's our pleasure. Yeah, I just thought um, we maybe could start off by talking a little bit about Malcolm. He's written some liner notes for you just in the last few months. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Um... Our new um, double vinyl album coming out, uh, which is a greatest hits live in studio package uh, in next week, um, has six liner notes, one from each member of Twisted Sister and one from Malcolm Dome. And, uh, and you know, it's not very often where you email someone and say, hey, I'm going to be in London next week, let's have lunch, and then find out that he died. <laughs> So I had just sent him an email saying, hey, I'm going to be in town next week. Let's have lunch. And then I get a text from my tour manager. And um, I, it, it, listen, on so many levels, he has been an enormous friend to me and the band, an enormous champion. He got it from the very beginning. He wrote about us so eloquently in Kerrang!, and in multiple magazines and and he's been on multiple liner notes because he's been at every major show we've ever played um i'm shocked you know i i mean i contacted him in may and i said malcolm we're gonna do this album uh and it's gonna have um it's gonna have songs from hammersmith marquee and astoria and uh you know i need just a a paragraph from you because you were at all three shows which spans um 30 years you know and uh he wrote these beautifully eloquent notes as he always does and his notes are the final words on on our liner notes uh it's you know it's impossible it, it's so hard to 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 uh to to to, to process this Here's the guy that calls me and he goes, Pete Way is sick, you should call him. Pete Way is really sick, you should call him. Pete Way died. You know, this is the kind of thing that, uh, does anybody even know what happened to Malcolm? Do, do, did he have a long-term illness and, and no one discussed? Because I never heard anything. Do you know anything? No, I, I, I don't. I, know, I, I would guess that his very closest friends uh, would know what happened, but it's certainly not something that's in the public domain. And I did see a publicist uh, comment that he missed an interview and he never missed an interview, a phoner. And um, so it was not something that people saw coming. I think it's, it's, it's safe to say. And just such an encyclopedic knowledge of um, the genre and such enthusiasm and, and long before you could look things up on Google, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't fake it. Um, um, and, and, you know, as someone that I admired from afar living in Australia and sending stories to Kerrang when I was a um, kid and, um, and just to run into him a couple of times at the crowbar and for him to remember, remember my name, you know, made my month, made my year. So um, I, I really I just thought it was important to mention him, but I, I can see that it's, you know, it's, um, it's something that's um, upsetting to you. So um, maybe we'll... Yeah, I, I also want to add too that in 1986, when I ran the New York Marathon, Malcolm came to New York and we trained together. We ran together on the reservoir because he was a runner as well. Um, those are the kind of memories that stay with you. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a shock to everybody. You know, he was part of the mainstay of, of the whole British metal revival thing. And, and what happened was Twisted was um, adopted by the British press as, you know, or, or it was perfect timing for us to show up there when we did playing the way we did. Um, as aggressively as we did and, and for those guys to uh, understand it and give us legitimacy where we had almost lost it back home. So um, it's a tough one. You know, I'm going to be in London 
next week, I'm going to be seeing some people, and I'm sure that the topic of Mr. Dome will be coming up consistently. Yeah, I'm sure. To, for him and his family, and um, you know, rest in peace, and all the other cliches that go with it. But he'll be seriously missed. We talked before we started recording um, um, about the fact you you know you've been busy, you've been on this uh, book tour, and um, sometimes when you're on a book tour, you, you get enough material to write another book. Um, must be some uh, must have been some good experiences, and just to have complete strangers send you an email and suddenly you're talking to them on Zoom. It's a it's not a normal thing, you know. How how have you found it? Uh, it's, it's a lot of work, <laughs> but you know, it's like, uh, be careful what you wish for. You know, it, you it, it's, it's, it's so ironic. You know, you call somebody up, how you doing? Oh man, I'm crazed. I'm crazed. I'm crazed. You know, I'm crazed. Well, what happens when you're not crazed? You're bored to death and then you're afraid, then you have fear that you're not crazed. So which one is it? Mm -hmm. You want to not be crazed or you want to be crazed? So it's overwhelming it's ongoing it's daily it's hourly and i'm promoting a book and you know that's what you sign up for so big deal listen i'm not on a tour bus i'm not driving 22 hours a day i'm not um, on a plane i'm in my office mm. you know like it doesn't suck you know <laughs> it, 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 i mean it really just doesn't suck i'm in my office and and i do these things i meet a lot of people hear a lot of comments. You know, what's interesting to me is one man's superstar is another man's, uh, you know, regular musician. Uh, when people say to me, oh, the legend, this, that, I go, really, to whom? I mean, I, I really don't even process that. I don't even know what that means. Because, you know, I've been living where I live all my life and nobody knows what I do. <laughs> An amazing it, story that you've lived there your whole life. It's incredible. Yeah, and, and, and the <laughs> fact that really people don't is make, makes me very happy because the last thing I want to do is is uh is live this thing and and my wife is very happy i wrote a book because she's so sick of hearing the stories <laughs> you know as 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 this just goes with somebody who's a personality this is not unusual to me but she says you know now we're at a dinner party someone starts asking me questions which they inevitably do she says look he's got a book buy the book here's his email send him an email let's talk about anything anything else except twisted sister please before we um had the first song jj i just wondered did you ever get to a point in your life where you didn't want to be jj french anymore that you were you realized you were known for this thing and you wanted to just escape it you know or was it always something that you felt you had to make the most of and that you were privileged to to have i think jj french is a character mm. and i'm not that character I, you know um i'm john and i'm not that to anybody anyone who knows me on a daily basis uh no so um do i accept it as a character yeah you know the same way maybe alice cooper accepts it or d i don't know i don't know what anybody else does in terms of how they process fame or success um i do value my anonymity a lot i think that that's i think stardom is way overrated uh personally i i, I don't need to be recognized i don't want to be um, you know, I think it was David Bowie to paraphrase and I paraphrase David Bowie and, and the actor, Tony Danza celebrity has no value except to get a good restaurant reservation and be able to get to a hospital or get a good, good doctor. If you're sick, that's about the, to me, that's about the value of celebrity. Let's have a song. JJ, you can hear from my accent that I'm from the Antipodes. And given that you are also the manager of Twisted Sister, it would be remiss of me as a journalist not to ask you about a certain Clive Palmer. Um, what an amazing episode it was. And I guess when you first heard it, did you believe that he thought he could get away with it? <laughs> you know, if I was 20 years old, I would be, but I'm not surprised. You know, people do what they do. And, and also as far as, a, as far as a national anthem or an international anthem we're not going to take it as this thing that's bigger than any of us could have ever imagined so the fact that um that people were singing we're not going to brexit on the steps of parliament two years ago and that wound up on the bbc someone filmed it and sent me the video of hundreds of people singing we're not going to brexit the fact that a guy running for the president of honduras right now has decided to rewrite the song we're not going to take it for his political campaign the fact that the president of spain currently is using we're not going to take it in his political campaign regardless of 
the legality or non-legality of the song and the usage and the personalities involved in using it, whether you like them, you don't like them, whether you find them disgusting, despicable, or you agree with them. The fact is that it's so much bigger than us um, that I, I'm constantly uh, amazed at the resonance that the song has and that it covers such a broad swath of philosophies, you know, from the left and to the right. So, um, of course, we got a lot of bad uh, emails or people, people because people do not understand what happens when a politician uses a song. They think that the artist must somehow endorse that person. And they also think or assume the artist is being paid a lot of money for it. So the first thing that happens is you get attacked, meaning us. How could you do this? And how much, you know, like you're just nothing but a bunch of whores. And, and of course, nothing is farther from the truth. If, they, if anybody understood how this works, they know that the artist doesn't get paid a penny no matter what happens in these situations, regardless whether it's licensed, not licensed, we don't get a cent. And especially when the person rewrites it, it has nothing to do with the artist. It has to do with the owner of the rights to the song. We don't own the song. The song is owned by a music publishing company. So the only thing that's bad is that we are assumed to be connected to this guy. Mm -hmm. This guy obviously was not liked by a lot of people. I guess fans of ours or that side of the political spectrum. So they assumed that we somehow supported him and we got a lot of bad publicity from it. And someone may say, well, any publicity is better than no publicity. Um, yes and no. These days, the political uh, world is so supercharged mm. and so alienating. Um, and you don't want to be associated with somebody that people really don't like. And, and in Clive's case, his arrogance. I don't think he thought he was going to be sued. That's really what I think. I think um, what's weird for him is that he tried to negotiate with the owners of the song. You, you, are you aware, you aware yes. of this a little I bit? I read that, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So he first approached them and said, I want to rewrite the song. Now, I don't even understand what we're not going to cop it means because I'm not Australian. So what does the phrase we're not going to cop it mean as a slang term? Exactly. The same as take it. <laughs> we're not going to take I'm it. Not, not gonna... I'm not copying that. You know what I mean? You know, it's all like... right. We're not going to. Okay. So there you go. So first of all, we're not going to cop it. I didn't quite get what that is. Secondly, he tried to negotiate a deal and then he didn't like the terms of the deal. So he went off and did it himself thinking he wasn't going to be, uh, he wasn't um, going to be pro prosecuted for it, which is, which is unbelievably arrogant in his case, because had he not done that, I would have been more, I wouldn't have been surprised. The fact that he tried to negotiate and then, then decided didn't want to do it. And from what I understand, he is being fined 10 times what it cost him, what would it have cost him to yeah. just, you know, because the company was going to let him do it. Mm. Which, by the way, they don't need to ask us our permission for that either. Mm. And they were, they were prepared to do a deal with him. And then um, he said he disappeared, did it himself. And from what I understand, the, the settlement well, not the settlement, but the, the fine was $1.5 million mm. or the equivalent, whatever the Aussie equivalent is, which is 10 times what it would have cost him to just pay. And this guy is extremely wealthy, correct? Yes. Very so, good. It, yep. so obviously this was purely just arrogance on his yeah. part. Yeah. That is a bit of a worry though, isn't it? When, you know, you, that the song could be licensed to anyone. You mentioned five or six examples there. And you also talked about reputational damage. What's to prevent someone that reputational damage happening with someone pays $150,000? Well, that's a good question. Um, because they don't need to ask us our permission mm. um, to do that. And um, uh, so then you have to handle the fallout day by day, mm. journalist by journalist. Now, in the case of Donald Trump, he used songs by many artists, Queen, Fleetwood Mac, Rolling Stones, and all these bands. And the recourse that an artist has, the only recourse an artist has really, is to just make a press statement mm. and say, we don't agree, we don't like you, stop it. And hopefully the embarrassment level of the press statement will cause the, art, will cause the person to stop using it, which is typically what does happen. Mm -hmm. What happens is the artist has actually no legal recourse there may be a clause in a contract having to do with some somehow, some way, um, 
an artist may have some, but it's very rare. So what you do is you what the Rolling Stones did and what Queen did and what Fleetwood Mac did and 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 so on and so forth. You just say, hey, I don't like you. Stop using it. And and they invariably stop using it because they don't want the bad rep. They don't want the continuing bad reputation in the press. So that's the recourse. That's that, really the only recourse. And by the way, we're not the only artists that's happened to. It's happened mm -hmm. to a lot of artists. Yeah. Is that kind of structure on the way out though, where, you know, the publishing is held by this big multinational and they can do whatever they want. Like your, um, your record you're putting out this month with Malcolm Dome's liner notes. Is that, that, is that your decision to put that out or is it the record company's decision to put that out? Well, we work um, with the record label. Mm. We have a great relationship with our record label. Mm. So we partner with them. But in general, artists don't control their music. And artists mm. don't control their music for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, Taylor Swift made this whole big deal about, oh, my music is being held by somebody else. Well, welcome to the club, Taylor. So is the Beatles, the Stones, who's up, Floyd, Queen, <laughs> everybody. You know, 99.9% .9 of every artist's album that you own in your collection, the artist does not own their copyrighted material. Now, that's fundamentally a problem philosophically and business-wise in the music industry where the artist signs, the artist signs away their rights, and then the artist has to pay back the label for something that they don't even own. I mean, it's one thing where you, 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 you record an album, um, someone else owns it and sells it, but you have to pay them back for the cost of making the record and you still don't own it. And that's a whole philosophical mm. thing. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a bigger issue, a much bigger, broader issue that affects, like I said, 99.99% .99 of all artists. Publishing is a different animal. If you're mm. the songwriter, you don't have to sell your publishing. You don't, mm. you can keep it. The question is, if you're broke, someone comes to you and dangles a check in front of you, will you sell it? And these days you see all these catalogs being sold because a lot of artists held onto their catalog, like Bob Dylan, you know, Stevie Nicks, a lot of them. And they held on, but the Beatles never held onto their catalog. You know, when the Beatles catalog came up for, re for, uh, for renewal in, in the 84, um, uh, Lennon and McCartney's estates you know, Lennon's estate, Yoko and Paul decided they didn't want it. It wasn't worth it. I mean, that may have been the biggest business mistake they ever made because the cost of it was only $50 million and Michael Jackson bought it and, and turned it into a multi-billion dollar business because uh, he needed to get rid of the money that he was making from the Thriller album because he had a ton of it that year. And, uh, and Paul and, and, and John's estate thought it was, wasn't worth it, which is mind blowing to me as a Beatles fan, but, but you know, I don't, not involved in the inner workings of their contracts, I don't understand it. But just be clear about this. You take a hundred artists in any given year and you're a publisher and you're gonna gamble on all of them. You know what the failure rate is? It's 95%. So if you give each one of these hundred artists $25,000, you've basically lost on 95 of them and you may win on five of them. And guess what, if you do win, you win really big. Mm -hmm. and if you happen to be one of those artists that really hit it big, then you'll say, well, why did I sell it? You know, I didn't, but at the time you did. So it's, it's a business venture. It's like anything else. And um, I don't cry about business ventures. You don't have to sign anything, yep. but you do. And I don't think I've mentioned this enough. The, the album, the, sorry, not the album, the book is called Twisted Business. And I do want to talk a little bit um, about business in this third and final part of the interview. Um, particularly as far as, if we let's we go back to like 1987 and we look at Bon Jovi, Rat, and Whitesnake, they're all in three very different places now commercially and their place in popular culture, and it'd be down to so many different factors. I think what you've said is a twisted sister have managed to hold on to that maybe that rarity, that scarcity, where if you wanted to go out tomorrow, you'd be playing big places, most places you go. It, how much of that is the ability to do that? Um, to be Def Leppard and be in a, star, in, in a big arena compared to Rat in a club, how much of that is down to um, design and long-term planning and how much of it is down to just the vagaries of the public and happenstance, you know? Uh, a lot of it is that, but a lot of it is also long-term thinking. So in my book, Twisted Business, uh, I talk about reinvention as, as, a, as a byproduct of why the band's successful. And... Um, um, I don't believe in luck. I do believe that that I do believe that opportunities occur when when preparation meets opportunity. So you always have to be ready to go for it. But if it was impossible to project 
many years ago that licensing music was going to be as important as it is now. And and in 1984, I don't think we could have seen I Want to Rock and we're not going to take it as being the, the gigantic licensing monsters that they are now. They're the two most licensed songs in the history of heavy metal at this point. But uh, you mentioned Whitesnake and you mentioned Rat. I would say that the class of 73 is, is Twisted Sister, Kiss, Judas Priest, and ACDC. Now think about that. All four of us started basically in 73 and look where we all are. Mm. Pretty good, mm. actually. Mm. You know, Judas Priest's legacy continues. ACDC, obviously, Kiss, Twisted Sister. That's a heavy duty class of 73. Uh, we're not an 80s band. We're a 70s band. And, and, and what happened to 80s bands, you know, happened to 80s bands. You know, we ended when the hair band thing com completely imploded because of, um, of, of the grunge scene. We already were out. You know, we were we had already stopped playing, so we did not suffer the collapse of the hairband market. In fact, we kind of got out of it early, and then you know, and then kind of hid like a bear in a cave, you know, in hibernation, and then you know, uh, came back in two thousand and one because of the nine eleven disaster, and then found a whole new life as a festival attraction. Um, but the the the, the forward thinking aspects of this, uh, I think, are partly me because I do tend to see things in a very big picture and I tend to see things really in advance. And, uh, you know, Keith Richards has a joke, but it's kind of true. You know, he says, what's the difference between him and Mick Jagger? And he goes, well, Mick gets up every morning and thinks, what am I doing today? What am I doing in 10 days from now, 10 weeks from now, 10 years from now? And Keith says, I got up this morning and said, I got up this morning, you know, so, <laughs> uh, so, you know, so you need those kinds of people, but you need the, the, you know, the big thinkers as well. And Twisted Sister ran on a dual track. You have D, an incredibly uh, creative human being who wrote these great songs and the band kind of had faith in his music. And you had my business acumen and they had faith in the direction that we were going in and the stability that, that, that I created as a company leader. So in the, in the twisted method, you know, the book is a bizwar. It's a business book and a memoir. I coined that phrase myself. I give myself all credit for that. And I teach the, the twisted method of reinvention. That, and I use the word twisted, T-W-I-S-T-E-D. Tenacity, the T, wisdom, inspiration, stability, trust, excellence, and discipline. And I take everybody through this uh, process piece by piece. So what you're getting from the book is not what you think you're getting. You're not getting this uh, this scandalous tell-all. I mean, there are stories. I, I'm assuming you have the book or read the book or gone through. I, the I book. only um, organized the interview like it's been organized in the last oh. two days. Okay, so, so you'll be getting. I'd love to. I can't wait okay. to see it. But yeah, it was all. Yeah. All um, so anyway, so the book takes you through this and, and, and people are saying, wow, it's kind of like you're the Tony Robbins of heavy metal. You know, Tony Robbins being this motivational mm -hmm. speaker. Yep. And the fact is that my, my mentor is a motivational speaker, uh, my co-author, Steve Farber, mm -hmm. who got me yep. into the business and co-wrote the book. I wanted to write a book that was easy to read, um, that was quick, because if I was leaving it to me, it would have been a 17 volume history. And now it's a 240 page synopsis of the of, the, the business behind it. But yes, if Twisted wanted to tomorrow come back, we would headline every festival we, in the world if we wanted to. But, you know, that's um, nothing that we've discussed. Can I finish up uh, by asking about three sort of recent, I, I, I guess they appear to be trends and whether they're actually going to stick around or not. Or um, Farewell tours, going out with no original members, maybe having a generational change where everyone in the band is is a generation younger than the original guys and also re-recording albums, re-recording old music. Are they three trends that are here to stay or are they just fads? Well, I think that if you would have asked ACDC, Judas Priest, Kiss or Twisted Sister in 1973, how long they'd be around, mm. I think we all would have said five years, mm. maybe 10 years. So there's no way we could have known. Mm. That the that the world would have changed, that the market changed, that the the, the desire to want to see bands change, you know, that just kind of, you know, just de developed and Im all imp impossible to tell. But I'm always a believer in the public decides. So mm. if you want to sell the public that you're no original guys, and they're buying it, then who am I to say, you know, it's not for me. Mm. If, if 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 you're selling that as a as a package to somebody say, come and see X band and we have nobody left or one guy left and you are good at what you do, but essentially you're a cover band. 
you know, or a tribute band or whatever. And, and, and that's a derogatory term. Why does it have to be that way? So if the public buys it, the public buys it. That, that's mm -hmm. all I have to say. I, I don't like it or don't like it. It's not for me to decide. Twist has always been a, a thing where, you know, we want to give you the real deal, mm -hmm. the way you bought your records. You want to come and see the show to the best of our ability. That's what we attempt to do. When AJ died, we got Mike Portnoy, you know, a super famous, great drummer, fan of the band who did the spectacular job filling in. Nobody said, oh my God, you know, but when ACDC went out without Brian Johnson, you know, with Axel Rose, uh, people didn't complain about mm -hmm. that. A uh, priest basically has two guys left, you know, Rob and, and Ian. I mean, the drummer's been around for Scott for many, many, many years. He's not the first drummer. He's not Les Binks or before that, but uh, it just depends what the public wants. Obviously, Alice Cooper's out there just being Alice Cooper, and those guys can change all day long, and White Snake tends to change its people all day long. So either you go to a White Snake show and you like it or you don't like it, and you'll tell people whether you like it or you don't like it. So that's it. As far as re-records are concerned, that's the one clause in record deals that's pro artist and and why they even let that one slide by mistake considering that record deals are some of the most draconian pieces of slave labor ever constructed by western civilization is incredible but i say take advantage of it now whether the couple whether the fans buy it the re-record that's up to them you know in our case um we record we re-recorded stay hungry called it still hungry and we use those songs to um, to uh, when we when we sell stuff for commercial use because we keep 100% of the of the money rather than give it to the record label. But mm -hmm. you know that's just we kind of saw that early and mm -hmm. got on it early and told other bands to do it. Whether other bands did it or not, I can't say. But it almost doesn't matter because you want to know why. Very few songs, very few bands um, are as fortunate as we are or artists, for example, whose song's constantly being used. So mm. who else gets used? Fleetwood Max, Don't Stop, Think About Tomorrow, Journeys, Don't Stop Believing. You know, there's certain songs that show up over and over again. The more they show up, the more they're used. That's kind of the strange part about it. Familiarity breeds more familiarity. And, 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 and an advertiser says, I want that, you know, because mm. people know it and they feel good about hearing it. And that's why James Brown, I Feel Good, is on every medical commercial in the world. You could use a million songs. Why isn't doctor, doctor, give me the news? But it's not. It's I feel good. And then it's a medical commercial. Mm -hmm. James Brown estate has to be sitting there smiling. You know, yeah, it's yeah. great. And what about farewell tours? Is there a moral responsibility <laughs> to tell the truth? I, I Well, man, that's a toughie. Maybe at the time a band announces a farewell tour, they mean it. You know, this is it. And then they don't mean it. Do, do I think they sit there and go, let's tell them as a farewell tour and then lie to them? Uh, maybe. Uh, again, don't you think it's the fan's decision? Either if a fan stops believing it, they'll stop going to it. Yep. Um, we can make jokes about farewell tours going back to the Rolling Stones. I mean, when the Stones played the Garden in 1972, the thing was, this was the last Rolling Stones tour, 72. And then 75 was the last Rolling Stones tour. And 78 was the last Rolling Stones tour. I don't even know if they said it. It was said on their behalf by their managers or somebody else. It's so hard you know, to say, but everyone's pretty cynical about it. So when we said this is our last tour in 2016, of course, oh my god you know of course you're going to be back and we've never had a discussion about returning ever so mm -hmm. we did we came back in 2003 for two years and it lasted 14. i thought that e and d thought oh two years three years tops three years later offers were getting bigger oh another year that'll be over another year comes back oh that'll be over by 2007 in fact we 2007 we just played two shows because we thought for sure it was over we didn't announce it was over we just said let's just do two because by next year it's over next year was even bigger and it kept going and going and going and going and going and it could continue to go and i'm not going to say it's never going to happen again it's just we haven't had a conversation about it that's it, about it it's amazing you got bands that are only around for three uh, three years the first time and they have fifteen year comebacks these days. But but um, JJ, thank you very very much for your time. I know we started off on a somber note talking about Malcolm, but I do appreciate you sharing your thoughts.